tonight is going to be an interesting night because what I want to do is lay a foundation for the Old Testament by showing you the beauty of Genesis 1 and 2. It is very deep and like much of the Word of God, it is multifaceted. Many of us may have come from ministries who thought that we knew a lot of the word and whatever our position was, was the right one, and that anyone else who had a differing opinion was inferior. <laughs> well, I don't believe that anymore. And the reason why I don't is because the lessons I learned from inspecting the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of his trademarks was his words were very deep and beautiful, ornately given with figures of speech. And also, they were multifaceted. You could look at them from many different ways and see many different things. And so there's not just one way to look at a particular scripture. You, we may find many different ways. Like in the Sermon on the Mount, I went through seven levels. In the Lord's Prayer, there are seven levels. In the Sermon from Heaven, Revelation 2 and 3, there are multi-levels. That is a characteristic of the word. And Genesis 1 and 2 is the same thing. So tonight, we're going to hear from Mr. Melvin Elliott. And I got to learn about him through his book that he wrote. And when I read that book, I thought to myself, wow, this is beautiful. And he had to swim upstream, basically, to write it. He'll tell you about that. <laughs> So tonight, we're going to hear from Melvin Elliott. So take it away, sir. Well, greetings one and all, and God bless you. As John said, he had asked me to share tonight on some aspects of a book I authored entitled Genesis 1, God's Table of Contents to the Bible, which was published a few years ago. Basically, it's about an amazing pattern of sevens which all relate together like layers of an onion to form something quite interesting and unique. In the book, I compare some amazing similarities between the seven days in Genesis 1 and the seven administrations, which span all the time of our present earth from Adam to the throne, as it were. After that comes a brand new heaven and earth, which if you keep counting upwards, would be the eighth. And this corresponds with E.W. Bullinger's book, Number in Scripture, where he shows that the number eight represents a brand new beginning. Or if you prefer, you may simply start over again at one. Looking at it this way, you can see a parallel between these two times because each one commences a new earth's beginning with paradise. The first one was the paradise of Eden. And in the next will be New Jerusalem, which is also called a paradise. Now, this idea is also in music. The first seven notes are called the diatonic scale. That's do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And then there's do again. If it's a higher note, we'd call it the eighth one, which completes an octave. And if it's lower, we just start over again. It's like this. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Do, that would be eight. Or, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. There's one. Either way. This becomes quite interesting when we consider Genesis chapter one, because the seven days there represent a week. And then you can start over again with another week. You can go round and round. With this understanding, you can have all the time you want. Weeks and months and years and well many eons of time. 
Now, there's two basic ways of looking at scripture. One is physical and the other is spiritual. An example would be to consider Genesis 1 in light of what God did to put the earth back together again after it had become without form and void. This would be a physical representation of what God accomplished over the course of those seven days. But another way to look at it is that Genesis 1 can represent much more time than merely seven 24-hour days. Consider 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And this happens to be one of those rare and special things which God does not want us to be ignorant of. So what do we do? We listen up because it's important. And with this in mind, each day in Genesis 1 can also be viewed as a thousand years. And thousand is representative of uh, an indeterminate number. That, that is, it doesn't necessarily have to be a literal 1,000 years. This term is generally understood as representing any very long period of time. And such are the seven biblical administrations. Now, I'm not going to attempt to cover everything in great detail tonight. You just can't squeeze so much into an hour or so. So tonight I'll be sharing some of the highlights, which I hope will illuminate your understanding of the Bible to a greater degree. Besides the seven days and the seven administrations, some other sevens which tie into this grand pattern are these. The letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and following, the seven angels sounding in Revelation 8, and the seven angels pouring out vials of wrath in Revelation 16. These all contain some wonderful and curious references to the seven administrations, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, concerning the book of Revelation, most people think it's only about the future. And I've even had people tell me not to even bother with it because we'll all be gone before any of that happens anyway. Well, these people obviously forget that even though it's not written directly to us, it is for our learning, right? So if we want to learn, we read it anyway, just like the rest of the Bible. And that includes the Old Testament, too. As John indicated, people become unnourished by just eating the same old stuff every single day. We need variety. The truth is, Revelation isn't only about the future. It's also about the past. And it even has present value because the lessons we can learn from it will help our lives in many ways. So in short, Revelation is relevant for all time, just like the rest of scripture, because what's written in the Bible is eternal truth. An example which most of you are familiar with is in Revelation 12, where we read about a woman clothed with a sun and the moon at her feet. Yes, I'm sure this has to do with some unrevealed future event, but at the same time, it speaks of the birth of Jesus Christ, which many understand to be September 11th, 3 BC, between 6.30 and 8 p.m. Palestine time. But in order to see that, you'll need a few other scriptures, along with the historical records of Josephus, some star charts, and perhaps a computerized astronomy program would come in handy. Also, there's a great book on this subject, E.W. Bullinger's Witness of the Stars. And another thing which John mentioned here, it's not right for someone to confine scripture into having only one correct or valid meaning. God has so masterfully authored his word that it may be understood on many levels. One example of this are the seven letters to the churches I mentioned earlier from Revelation 2. Now, of course, most everyone understands these pertain to future Israel, but I've also seen work done on their historical aspect in reference to first century believers who actually passed these letters around during that time. Some scholars have also used these seven letters to indicate certain traits and qualities which in God's eyes are beneficial for believers to have. And for any one of these writers to suppose his version is the only correct one. Well, 
that would be a sore mistake. And then there's my take. I see how these relate with the seven administrations. Perhaps this is more of a spiritual or symbolic reference, and I certainly wouldn't count this viewpoint out either. <laughs> As an example, at the end of the first letter, we read in Revelation 2, 7, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, we understand this to be a promise of access to that tree during the future paradise of New Jerusalem. But isn't it interesting that we also see some very similar wording in Genesis 2.9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Here it is, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Now, if that were the only one of these parallels, one might suppose it to be a mere coincidence. But after seeing dozens and even scores of them, we must conclude that these may be part of some divine design. And believe me, folks, they are. Reading the second letter, you'll see references to death three times. It's talking about death on a massive scale. Well, how about the second administration? Could you think of Noah's flood as also being an example of death on a massive scale? Well, sure you can. Everyone in the whole world died except the eight who were safe aboard the ark. And hey, that represents a brand new beginning too, doesn't it? For those eight <laughs> starting over. Okay, then how about a curious reference to Noah's flood during the second administration on the second day in Genesis 1? After the worst was over, when the rain stopped, what was there to be seen beside the ark and those in it? Just water and sky, right? No mountains either, just water and sky. Now look closely at the second day in Genesis. Five times each and nothing else, God mentions water and firmament, sky. Now how interesting is that? Now look at how the third day begins. Genesis 1.9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And what's happening with the continuing story of Noah? We read in Genesis 8, 13, it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. When you read this word behold, it's kind of rare God uses it. It's kind of like saying, hey, stop, check this out, man. This is great. The face of the ground was dry. We just read that on the third day, he said to let the dry land appear. So that's kind of a key. And that's no coincidence either, people. The beginning of the third day in Genesis 1 relates with the continuing story of what was happening after the 40 days and nights of rain were ended. Now here's something interesting. The phrase, these are the generations of, that phrase is only found in a few places in the Bible. It can reveal to us the actual defining line between one administration and the next, because it narrows down the progeny. You know, who begot whom, those, all, all those begots, to one man in particular, who is the principal one involved during an administration. This phrase appears for the very first time in Genesis 2-4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. You see how this verse begins an entirely new line of thought? God is expla explaining creation all over again from a different vantage point. In the previous verses, God had just concluded his six days of work and his resting on the seventh day. Genesis 2-3 concludes those seven days, the first week, so to say. And to me, this point not only marks the conclusion of the Bible's table of contents, but Genesis 2-4 also begins what I like to refer to as the text of the Bible. This is not a new idea God came up with. <laughs> we use that all the time in manuals of every kind and in uh, literature and in school and college 
textbooks and things. You, you got a table of contents and where that ends. Well, then you get to read the details when you see the text of the Bible. This is no different. God knows how to write. He's a master author. So let's follow this through and see how it works. We'll look at the very next time this phrase is used. Turn to Genesis 5, 1 through 3. This is the book of the generations of Adam. See it? In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them and called their name Adam. In the day that they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Here, it looks like God's telling the story all over again from the beginning, doesn't it? But wait just a darn minute. What about the Garden of Eden and what happened there? And what about the story of Cain and Abel? Did God forget? <laughs> you know, he's been around for a very long time, right? You suppose he's becoming senile in his old age? No, that isn't it. He doesn't need to tell us those things again, because now he's trying to introduce different lessons for us to take heed of. From verses 4 through 31 of Genesis 5, record eight more generations from Enos to Noah. And in each and every case, it says they died. And then in verse 32, we read, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Then chapter 6 tells of the depravity of mankind and how God, in so many words, was having second thoughts about having made them. They were really screwing up. And then in Genesis 6, 8, we read, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And right after that is when we finally see our key phrase again. Here it is, Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Now, technically, the second administration ended at the moment Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden. But here, after a transition, which I like to think of as a, a ripple effect, we see the official beginning of the second administration. And I like to call it what Paul did on Mars Hill in Acts 1730, the time of ignorance. And then we see the story of Noah, the flood, and the ark. Now, after the next administration called the law, comes the Christ administration. And again, we see this phrase come up in Matthew 1, 1, right at the beginning of the gospel period. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Here's where Jesus' lineage is traced back to Abraham. And beginning in Luke 3.23, Jesus' lineage is traced all the way back to Adam. And here's another point I'd like to make about this. It isn't necessary to show the beginning of our fifth administration, also known as the grace or mystery administration, using the phrase, these are the generations of, as with the rest thus far, because our heritage does not rely on any physical bloodline. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Colossians 1.26, even the mystery which has been hid from ages, and here it is, and from generations, see it, but it is now is made manifest to his saints. So that's one example of how we can look for key phrases which will aid us greatly in demarking the different times within the scriptures. Now, here's some more curious references to this pattern of sevens I'm trying to show you. We all know that the sun, moon, and stars are only mentioned on the fourth day, right? Well, let's look at each of the fourth angels in the book of Revelation. Revelation 8, 12, and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it. That's interesting, too. And this fourth angel is the only one of the seven angels to even mention sun, moon, and stars. And it even reminds me of something which happened in the Gospels during the fourth administration. Jesus had just died, 
and there was darkness everywhere for a period of time, right in the middle of the afternoon. Wow. And in Revelation 16, 8, first part of the verse, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, S-U-N. Again, I ask, is this a coincidence or is it part of something much bigger? Hey, getting back to Revelation 12, 1, about the woman clothed the sun and the moon at her feet in reference to the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, how about the fourth day? How does that day begin? Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let there be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The Greek word from the Septuagint for signs is simeon, which is used to authenticate an important event, which has been prophesied about. Hey, what more important event can you think of than the birth of Jesus Christ? <laughs> and the word for seasons is talking about an appointment, like going to the doctor at a certain place at a certain time. Well, isn't this how Matthew and Luke both begin with the story of the birth of Jesus? You see, the fourth day and the fourth administration have much in common, don't they? In fact, the fourth day being central to this wonderful pattern with three days on either side is a marvelous key to understanding the very heart of the entire Bible because the Christ administration is also fourth with three administrations on either side. So this puts Jesus Christ right smack dab in the very middle of everything in the entire word of God. Through study, I learned that Jesus Christ is the only one in the Bible to ever be called by the term great light. And that's marvelous because he just happens to have a lot in common with the sun on the fourth day, which is also called a great light. Even as the sun is a source of life, energy and power for the earth in the physical sense, Jesus Christ provides these very same things. You see, Jesus Christ is the very source of spiritual life, energy, and power for the church. And check this out. Even as the sun, according to what's written, has a threefold purpose, so also does Jesus Christ. Matthew 4.23, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. This is also repeated in Matthew 9.35. Well, let's take a closer look at those three things God says the Son does. And let's not forget to put on our thinking caps because this is tremendous. One thing the sun does is to give light upon the earth. And this is exactly what we're doing when we witness. Philippians 2, 15 and 16, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, doing what? Holding forth the word of life. And then we invite these people to where they can learn more than just the good news, you know, Caruso. So they can hear a little bit about the uh, other side of the coin. And that's when we show them the difference between what's right and wrong, good and bad, wise and foolish. And this requires teaching, didasco, which is the second thing the sun does. According to God, it divides the light from the darkness. Pretty amazing, huh? Well, how about the third thing the sun does? It rules over the day and over the night. Isn't this what Jesus did when he performed his very first miracle, healing the man born blind? He couldn't see, and everything was dark to him. But Jesus literally ruled over the night in that man's life, and he could see for the very first time. And what about when Jesus cast devil spirits out of people? Wasn't he ruling over the spiritual darkness in their lives as well? And they were healed, weren't they? And what about Jesus Christ ruling over the day? Well, we're called children of the day, right? And we've made him our Lord, which means we allow him to have rule over us, right? Well, there you go. And when we allow this word of God to have rule in our lives, we're healthier, aren't we? 
as it is written, he sent his word and healed them. He didn't say he sent his word and gave them knowledge or inspiration or any number of things. He sent his word and healed them. That's in the heart of the word. And this has been a great example of what I mean when I say that Genesis 1 works just like a table of contents to the Bible. Because amazingly enough, this fourth day not only alludes to the birth of Jesus Christ as foretold in the stars, but also to everything he did while he lived during the Christ administration, which is the fourth one. You see, everything Jesus did during his earthly ministry all boils down to a combination of preaching, teaching, and healing. And we just saw this from Genesis 1. But if we want to see the details, well, then we need to read the text. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, wasn't that something? Now, my friends, there's yet another pattern of sevens connected with all this, which forms an additional layer on top of the seven days, administrations, letters to the churches, and the seven angels twice in Revelation. And that is the first seven manifestations of the gift of Holy Spirit as listed in order in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First off, many of you might be wondering why I say this, when we all know that there are actually nine manifestations listed. Think of it like this. Speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues are unique to our administration. And when it's over, these will be gone. These first seven were operated during the Old Testament and in Christ's time when the Spirit was upon people. It may be interesting to note that once Jesus received the Holy Spirit, which came down upon him as a dove, you never read that it ever left him. Hmm, that's something to think about. During our grace administration, we also have these seven. But the difference, of course, is that Holy Spirit is an integral part of our new nature, and we can't lose it like Adam did when he disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. And that's one reason God declares this gift, also known as the gift of Christ, to be incorruptible, can't be corrupted. And those seven will still be available in the future as well, after the gathering together, or as many people like to call it these days, the rapture. <laughs> Can you imagine there being no more wisdom? knowledge and faith etc during that most challenging time except that which is operated by jesus christ himself i should say not and that goes especially for the manifestation of discerning of spirits if there was ever a need for that one it would certainly be during that most austere time so in essence those last two manifestations sort of drop off the list leaving the first seven which are in common to the rest of scripture. And by the way, tongues is listed eight, which reminds me of my brand new beginning. When I became born again and spoke in tongues for the very first time, how about you? Do you remember your very first time? Yes, I can finally remember the first time I spoke in tongues. It was during the final session of a class called PFAL in a ministry which I no longer associated with, and for good reason. But don't get me wrong, I still have some very fond memories of much of the time I spent there, and especially in my early days when it seemed the scale was tipped in favor of grace. Yeah, <laughs> maybe too much grace at times. <laughs> but I still think... That was better times in the word than later on when it went the other way under a new president with too much law. Oh, God. <laughs> Perhaps many of you here tonight can relate with this, huh? Yeah, I remember all right. How could I ever forget how their leadership and even the clergy, the reverends, mind you, treated my own personal research? Now, I don't often bring these things up, but I feel in my heart that this may be one of those rare times. So please bear with me. And believe me, folks, I, I'm not doing this to complain, but I offer it as a, a staunch warning to follow what God has placed upon your heart, no matter what others think about it. I just thought of Ephesians 6, and having done all, to 
stand. That's it, stand. And if you're having a bit of trouble listening to God and his still small voice, just maybe there's something I'll be sharing tonight, which can give you hope along that line. But I'm not done ranting yet. <laughs> That's exactly what I did for years, to stand upon the greatness of what I believe God has shown me while nobody in the leadership of that ministry wanted to seriously consider what I had discovered. Oh, yeah, they loved me playing the guitar and singing their music on stage in front of hundreds of people. And I'll honestly say I really didn't mind the applause and the standing ovations at times, be that as it may. Hell, even put up with my jokes, bless their hearts. And my wife's over here smiling. <laughs> and of course, they sure didn't mind when I was giving them 25% of my weekly paycheck before taxes. No brag, just fact. But what they didn't want from me was what I considered to be my greatest treasure, my greatest treasure, the word of God. I can't tell you how much that hurt my heart over the years. I think I eventually had to leave them simply because I'd been injured by their lack of care. I was bleeding. No, not literally. I, I just felt as if I was bleeding spiritually. And that's why I used the word staunch a minute ago. And that not only does that word relate with something strongly made, but it also has to do with checking or stopping the bleeding. I guess I finally left that ministry so I could get healed up. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you something, folks. And I hope he doesn't mind my saying this, but you have no idea just how much John Nessel has done for me personally which spiritually healed my heart from much pain. He's one of the greatest ministers I've ever known. And this man truly cares for God's people. Well, basically, I had learned many biblical research principles from the classes I attended while with that ministry. But sadly, it seems that my trouble with them began when I attempted sharing some of the wonderful things I found by putting those same principles to work in my personal study of the word of God. Basically, they expect people to blindly follow without question what they commonly referred to as the present truth. And to challenge any of their conclusions was a very loud no, 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 no. For many years, I tried in vain to make available wonderful discoveries to them. Some of which I'm sharing this very evening with you guys. Listen. The very notion of doing biblical research was so appealing to my nature that I joined the way for that very reason. And now looking back, I find it truly ironic that it was also biblical research, my own that is, which eventually provided me a way out of there. <laughs> so, well, where was I? Oh, yeah, manifestations and their order in 1 Corinthians 12. Now I know why I thought of that ministry, because that's where I first learned about these nine manifestations. And they taught these in a different order than what we see here in this chapter. Basically, they put them into three groups of three each, according to what made sense to them. First group of three is called the worship manifestations of speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. Second group is what they call the revelation manifestations, word of knowledge word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. And the last group of three was what they called power manifestations of faith, miracles, and healing. And I have no qualms with this way of breaking down the nine manifestations. It seems a rather practical way. And that ministry is dedicated, three classes in particular, by which to teach those in that order, the foundational, the intermediate, and the advanced class. But it was when I tried to show them this other way when things didn't go well for me because they had made a doctrine of this approach and nobody could teach these manifestations any other way without being you know, called on the carpet. But I will share this approach with you guys and I think you'll love it. So what I want to share with you now is a tremendous truth. Well, at least that's the way I see it in my eyes at this present time and my understanding of scripture. I think that if God had wanted to name the Bible, 
he just might have called, entitled it something like this, like an infomercial. <laughs> How to walk by the spirit in seven easy lessons. I like that. <laughs> Wife smiling again. How to walk by the spirit in seven easy lessons. And why do I say this? Because it appears to me that God has highlighted one of these manifestations in particular within each of the seven administrations, which span all the time of this earth we li live in right now. And they're in the very same order as the list. It's just like as if God had designed his written word for this one express purpose to teach us how to make the best use of the greatest gift he ever bestowed upon anyone at any time. And I believe in my heart that it's his greatest expectation for his children to really put that gift to use in their lives and to help others with. Now, before I get started on this, we need to understand that there's a reason for their names. The word of wisdom isn't really that different from wisdom itself. And word of knowledge isn't really that different from knowledge itself. Or God wouldn't have named them as such. Why would he ever want to make things difficult and confusing for his kids? Well, he doesn't. He makes it as easy as pie. And it's not difficult to reason why word of wisdom might be listed first in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Proverbs mentions truths related to this in many places, like in Proverbs 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. And in Proverbs 8.20, I, wisdom, lead in the way of righteousness. And wisdom certainly seems to be an important aspect of the first administration in Eden. But before we go there, let's turn to Proverbs 8. Verse 33 offers a rather basic definition of what wisdom involves. Hear instruction and be what? Wise and refuse it not. Now, Adam's basic task was one of wisdom, which appears to be the very first lesson in the word of God for man to learn about. God only gave Adam this one instruction, which consisted of two parts, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. As long as Adam would obey this one instruction, as we just read in Proverbs 8, would be acting wisely, then things would go well for him. In a sense, this proper action would not only equate to wisdom and folly, but also to right and wrong, good and evil, and even life and death. Remember, thou shalt surely die. Hey, let's take a short tangent and see another thing which I don't believe to be a coincidence. On the very first day in Genesis, God divided the light from the darkness, right? And we just saw him do the very same thing in his first instruction to Adam, where God divided the light from the darkness, in a spiritual sense, you might say. Simply, that one instruction was do this and avoid that. The first part of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, that's the light part, which God prefers. And the second part, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, etc., was the dark part, which God does not prefer. And we just read in Proverbs 8, where God warns against refusing his instruction, because that's just not wise. <laughs> it's foolish. So do you see it? The first day in Genesis 1 has much, which relates to the very heart of the first lesson in the first administration, the lesson of wisdom. I hope this is clear to you guys. But before I go a bit further, let's try to make this whole concept even simpler by offering you the opportunity to apply your own personal scope of the Word of God to at least make some logical sense of things here. Where in the Word of God do you suppose you'll see the most healings taking place? That is the manifestation of the gifts of healing. During what administration? Well, I think the answer is quite obvious. The Christ administration, which is the fourth time in God's word. 
So is it any wonder why gifts of healings is listed fourth in 1 Corinthians 12? Makes you think, doesn't it? How about miracles being listed fifth? Can we make any sense out of that? We know there have been miracles all throughout the scriptures, but there's one miracle which eclipses them all, which many consider to be the miracle of all miracles, the new birth. Is it any wonder why that manifestation is only available during the age of grace, the fifth administration? Well, let's get back to the story. We'll proceed ahead now to what I like to refer to as the second lesson to learn about in the word of God, and that is the word of knowledge. We saw that the very words God spoke to Adam gave the gist, the sum and substance of what wisdom entailed making a proper choice in life by choosing to obey God's instruction. So let's see who God speaks to next and what he says then. And that happens to be no. Oh, my God. What about the others in the believers line from Seth on? Didn't God ever speak to them? What about Methuselah? Can you imagine living for nearly a thousand years and God never speaks to you even once? Well, that's ridiculous. Of course he did. But the neat thing is that God reserved that very special figure of speech, condescensio, God speaking as a man, for something most important. So as I just said, the next person after Adam, which the Bible declares God spoke to, was Noah. And what he says in particular will define what we're suspecting may be the second lesson for us to learn about in the word of God. Without having to read it all, here's a short summary. God informed Noah the world was about to end, that he should build an ark to save himself and his family. He told them what kind of wood to use, his dimensions, you know, the specific length, width, and height, and cubits, what to put into it, how many clean and unclean animals, how many male and female, where to put the windows and the door, and very important, how to use pitch to waterproof the ark, so that it wouldn't sink. <laughs> now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know what manifestation this may be in reference to, does it? Is it discerning of spirits, healings, miracles? Of course not. This list of very detailed instructions is most obviously the word of knowledge. That's the second administration and the second manifestation. It's just too easy, folks. <laughs> And here's something else. Why was it that only Noah received this wonderful revelation? It was simply because as far as we know, he was the only one on the planet still adhering to the first lesson. He was the only one acting wisely, while the rest were, according to Genesis 6, 5, only imagining evil in their hearts continuously. And this put Noah in a very favorable position, one that even we should constantly be aware of in our lives. As we remain faithful to the instructions God has allowed us to understand personally, then we'll be in the perfect position for God to also provide us with some word of knowledge, even as he was able to do for Noah because of his faithfulness. And here's a short word for the wise. If we're not being faithful to what we're responsible for, then I suggest going to God and taking care of the problem. You know, fess up. Otherwise, your conscience is going to be bothering you. It'll get in the way until you finally do so. Okay, then who's next? The very next person the Bible says God spoke to is found in Genesis 12, 1. And we read, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And here, we don't see exactly what God has said to Abram. In fact, looking back from here, you never find a record where God actually did this. And because we don't get to see God's exact words to Abram, they really aren't that important for us, as were the exact words which were spoken to Adam and to Noah. And for this understanding, we need to go to the Believer's Hall of Fame, as many call it. And we should already understand that this 11th chapter of Hebrews is speaking about 
the manifestation of faith. And we read in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abram, when he's called out unto a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. And herein lies the very definition, the basics of what this manifestation of faith is all about. Abraham didn't have any specifics to go on, as Adam and Noah did. His operation of faith was simply this, with literally nothing to go on except to get out of Dodge. <laughs> he just went, and all the details he would ever need would simply be supplied later on to, to a city that I'll show you. God said, go, and Abraham went. The manifestation of faith is just as simple as that, to obey God without questioning or arguing. It's just like in the Nike commercials. Just do it. Has my wife smiling again. <laughs> just do it. And hey, you suppose there's a reason why this manifestation is listed third in 1 Corinthians 12? Well, you bet there is. As we read this chapter, we see the profound exploits of many of the famous old testament believers by faith isaac by faith jacob by faith joseph by faith moses by faith Rabbi. and then beginning in verse 32 we read the following and what shall i more say for the time would fail me to tell of gideon and barak and of samson and jephthah and of david also and samuel and of the prophets who through faith this manifestation of faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. On and on and on. Here's what God is really trying to say. Hey, kids, I just don't have the time here in Hebrews 11 to show you the greatness of this wonderful manifestation. But if you want to learn out exactly how it works, then just go to the Old Testament, read some of those records, and do keep in mind that I'll certainly do no less for you than I did for any of them. And just what administration are we talking about, folks? The third one, of course. Could God have made this any easier to understand? He wants us to learn in intricate detail the how of using these seven manifestations. And as I, said, as I said before, God has written an entire administration's worth of information about each one of these in particular, and their order is the same as in the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay, then, what about the manifestation of prophecy? And for this one, we won't be speaking of its particular use where people are called upon to do so in a believer's meeting, per se, like we heard earlier tonight before I began sharing. Instead, we'll simply be focusing on the foretelling part of a prophet who's operating this manifestation. And of course, this may also be in concert with his gift ministry as well. Many future events have been foretold by the prophets of old like Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Amos, and others. And let's not forget about Daniel and his seven weeks prophecy, which there's been a whole lot written about these days from what I've seen. Yeah, people are really into that one. Anyway, some of these have already come to pass, both in Jesus' time and in ours. And some will be coming to pass during the time Jesus Christ rules from his earthly throne for a thousand years in what people call the millennium. But I would personally estimate that about 80 to 85 percent, the vast majority of all of these prophecies will be happening upon earth between the end of our administration, the fifth one, and the beginning of the seventh, when Jesus Christ returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Revelation 19. And that's the sixth administration the time of wrath, I call it. So I ask again, is it any wonder why prophecy is listed sixth in 1 Corinthians 12? Finally, we come to the seventh one, discerning spirits. Why is it seventh? 
And what might that one have to do with the seventh administration? Well, it's pretty simple, folks. That time in the word of God just happens to be at the height, the very apex of devil spirit activity in the whole word of God. In fact, there's another seventh place where we see this as well. We can surely understand that Adam and Eve lived in the first administration of this second earth. And we know there were things happening even before that, which would make Eden as a starting over or a brand new beginning, which is eighth. Remember where I began this teaching about octaves and such? So just before each of the eight times, the new beginnings of both the second and third earths is the seventh time of each of those worlds. We just mentioned a bit about this concerning the latter part of the book of Revelation. So let's compare these two times in God's word and see what we can come up with. Here are five things to compare. One, a great event takes place at the tail end of the first earth, which made it become without form and void. Two, it was a time of great devil spirit activity, which the universe had never seen. There was a war in heaven going on in an attempt to overthrow God's throne. Three, every one of Lucifer's one-third of the angels of heaven were involved in this conflict. Four, they lost the war. And five, they were kicked out of heaven to the earth. And after that, Lucifer's name was changed to Satan and the devil. So what about the next time? Again, we're speaking of the end of an earth in the seventh time, just prior to the brand new beginning of the third earth with New Jerusalem. Point number two, again, there's war. This time it's upon earth and it ends with the last battle at Armageddon. Point three, again, all of the devil spirits are involved. You just can't get more devilish than that. It's the apex of devil spirit activity. Again, they were in an all-out ditch effort to attempt beating God. And in fact, God even lets the worst ones out of prison for a season, just so the devil couldn't say after the fact, well, God, if you'd have let me have those henchmen in my army, we'd have beat you this time. Point four, and of course, again, they'll lose the war. And finally, point five, again, they'll be kicked out. And this time, it'll be to the lake of fire. Isn't it also interesting that part of the operation of discerning of spirits is knowing whether or not to kick them out? And from what I just shared, in both places, God decided to kick the spirits out. Well, folks, that's just a bit of overview into something extremely vast in the word of God. It's huge, all right, and very fascinating. But to be honest, I know in my heart it is just a drop in the ocean compared to what's really all about. And just one more thing about the seventh time being at God's throne. Seven stands for spiritual perfection. And that's exactly what God will be doing when he judges the words and deeds of every man who ever lived, beginning with Adam. Also handing out rewards and consequences to the exact measure due. No more and no less of what they deserve. And he knows about the extenuating circumstances because he understands people's hearts. It's not just cut and dry, you know, good and evil. God, God will take everything in consideration. You talk about discerning of spirits. Wow. And, and of course, numbers also have their antithesis or opposite meanings, like two. It can be to establish or it can be to divide. Negative seven represents spiritual imperfection, which also explains the many devilish things happening near the end of the earth, just prior to the judgment by God from his throne. Well, folks, the word of God is so deep, we just aren't able to fathom it, yeah, pun intended. But it sure keeps us going, doesn't it? Learning new things about the scriptures is an exciting adventure. Sometimes it gets a little tiring, even as it says in Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, much study is a weariness to the flesh. But I'll tell you something, nothing I know of is as, as exciting as discovering a little nugget of gold or a beautiful gem 
after studying all day or for a week or a month. These sorts of things are exactly what makes all of the hard work worthwhile. And another thing which makes it worth all the effort is when you have a golden opportunity to share your discoveries with the wonderful believers. So the bottom line is this. You just never, just never give up on what God is showing you. As it's written, seek and ye shall find. And shall makes it absolute. Thank you all for listening. And God bless you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Didn't Mel, that was awesome. Didn't you oh, love thanks. that? Yes. I have it, Mel. Went, it, it went smoothly. <laughs> Mel, I have, this is Diane Martinez talking. I have your book sitting here right next to me and I'll never oh. forget. I'll never forget sitting in your table not knowing you not knowing exactly what I was going to teach that day and then I you surprised me with that book when I came back from the teaching and I almost just blew my mind <laughs> absolutely and, it, and it's still blowing my mind yeah so, I remember you liked the color part oh, of it oh yeah, yeah yeah I loved no, it all I loved it I, all I didn't have time to mention that tonight but you know <laughs> anybody can have my book if they want it it's out yes. of print so I make them I, available I highly suggest it, and I love the subtitle, Genesis 1, God's Table of Contents to the Bible. I, I don't know of a better way, a more magnificent way of saying it, and then how you, how you compare it to any author writing a book. You start with the table of contents, and then you, <laughs> get, in, and then you get into the meat of it. Just awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm spiritually it, it, energized all over again well great you know i had a dear friend that uh, i was trying to come up with a title and she wanted me to call it the tapestry of light you know i almost i almost chose that but uh -huh. i'm a little more analytical so there you go yeah uh, absolutely awesome thank you so much for sharing oh you're welcome diane that, that blesses me to hear yeah the church today is uh always like trying to put the holy spirit power in the closet somewhere like it's some you know okay oh it's special or something but you know but this you uh, the way you teach that just shows that the spiritual power of god in each and every administration and it's mm -hmm. just a list of all the things god has done there's you know spiritual history without the holy spirit i guess but it really yeah. it really just kind of shows god's purpose through the ages so well yeah well one thing i didn't quite share right I taught these as though they're all individual, but we know that the Holy Spirit works like a clump, like, you know, all together. Uh, so you can find healings every place in the Bible, but the foundation of that is when you make the Gospels your own and the healings that took place there. Well, you can see those same things again, the foundation everywhere you look. Sometimes God will augment, he'll add more in other places where you see healings, but you can't get away from the initial place. And like discerning of spirits, you'd be surprised the things you can find out about that manifestation if you look between the time Christ comes back as King of Kings and, and uh, the throne. There's a ton of practical information that, that you can track through the whole word once you get the foundation there first. Well, hey, I'm rambling. Go ahead. Oh, that was great. <laughs> well, when I read Mel's book, it was a very humbling experience for me because i had taught something different about the administrations when they began and i thought that my evidence was very strong it still is yes very strong however mel's perspective also is equally strong and and I had, I was compelled to let him teach. I was compelled by the beauty of the symmetry and the symbolism that he saw and I didn't. Because he thinks different than I do. I'm, I'm not a symbolic guy. But he gravitates to that and understands it. And so I was, I was so struck by it. I encouraged him 
And, you know, I told him, I don't care if what you share differs from mine a little bit because you see that the beauty of it, it, you know, and how wonderful it is. Well, your take is pretty much like from a historical right viewpoint and mine is more like from a spiritual viewpoint and like i said like concerning those letters in uh, revelation right there's many levels god has not (laughs) preserved himself to only one right thing so that there's credence in a lot of that stuff you can't just turn a blind eye because you got one thing and you think that's the skinny (laughs) that's boy that's narrow-mindedness to a t (laughs) <laughs> right. And see, that only wins certain kinds of people to the Lord, to the word and to the Lord. But when you see the whole panoply, when you see all the different dimensions, then the other dimensions win other people and enthrall them because it is greater than any one of us. Oh, see that. And see, this is why I was so blessed with what you had to say with your warning and with your example about you need to move with what God has placed on your heart. Oh, and and yeah. every one of us, every one of us, as we mature in the word, will probably have a specialty. You know, those of us who are fellowship teachers i think that we should publish something that's our favorite teaching just make a tape and make it available write a pamphlet write a whole book write a poem write a song have a legacy because it's something god gave you i'm sure all of us who have teaching in our fell in our homes will um will have some favorite subject and so that's something that you you want to pass on because it's what God gave you. And Mel, you were brave and and you were an example of that. You just didn't let them stop you. And now, look, I'll, look what I'll it mention, produced. I'll mention something else. My wife, Adina, she stood behind me the whole freaking way. She my, I couldn't have done it without her, John. Yeah. Couldn't have done it without her. Right. And see, this, this is why it's so important to not allow yourself to get stuck up. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you just have, to, there's always going to be someone smarter than you. Oh, there's yeah. always going to be something else that God has up his sleeve because God is infinite. And you can't put that in a bottle or a box, you know? And so like that phrase, these are the generations of, you saw a signpost. That's what I call it. That's what Ren taught about too. That's a signpost phrase. It it is an associated Uh, term that goes with those time periods. See? I have to remember that word, signpost. Yeah. Better than just saying key. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, bookend is another one. Yeah. So anyway, tonight's been a great night. If anybody else has anything to share, go right ahead, please. How do we get a hold of this book? Uh, you can email me and I'll send you a free PDF copy. Uh, I'm not interested in the royalties. It doesn't matter uh, because actually the, the publisher is out of, out of, uh, out of business. And uh, I put it on the uh way beyond it's in the file section and i, I don't I'll, have facebook i'll include oh, yeah. i bought it it's i there. bought it on amazon but, hey, let, let me let me type my email out here on chat i have purchased it on amazon oh I, there's recently very, there's varying prices there by a lot of scalping going on <laughs> i only i only paid about ten dollars for it oh well, that's good i saw it there one time for uh three four hundred dollars <laughs> oh my i saw I can, it on there tonight I, for 147 oh, oh my. hey uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a break i'll sell it to you for 75 no just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I read. Hey. I did recently buy it not too long ago, and I read it like in three days. But really? I did get it on Amazon. What I'm thinking is, if any of you want help in publishing something, contact me. I've self-published. I have experience with Kindle. Uh, it used to be called something different, but there's like seven or eight different self-publishing platforms out there that you own your stuff still. Um, it's not like some of these publishers where they buy it from you in essence and they mm -hmm. sell it for you. They market it for you. Right. Uh, that was the one publisher that Mel chose for his book. And they were not very fair with how they dealt with him <laughs> and other people. And now they are out of business. Serves Worse away. than that, John. Uh, yeah. uh, so some of them got caught up in Canada and they got extradited on uh, certain things. And well, they're behind bars. <laughs> some right. of them. Right, but and so, it's interesting that when I was dealing with them and writing my book at that time, I think they were on the up and up. Okay, but anyway, if any of you need help to publish a book, there's a number of authors. Peter Arbeeb's an author. I'm an author. Uh, Linda Lackey's written some a bunch of things, um, and there are other people besides us, Mel, of course, that ask us questions, we'll encourage you, and we'll give you pointers on how you can put your stuff out there, because you never know. Uh, you've heard the story of Bishop Pillai. Yep. Bishop Pillai was a high caste Hindu, and he became born again from a scrap of the Bible that he picked up. Wow. wow. He wow. read it and it struck his heart. Wow. Well, who knows who might read something that you write and the Lord utilizes that in the same way. Wow. So um, I, I put my email address there to everyone uh, right. in the chat. If you just press chat, you'll see it. And just email me and I'll, I'll take care of it. Right. And if you miss it, Email me and I'll give you Mel's address, all right? Thank you. I remember looking this book up on Amazon and it is $147. <laughs> well, yeah. so, somebody kind of was kind of scalping it, I'm sure. But when I was selling them, that was like $15 or something. I think you can sell, um, if I'm not mistaken, they, they uh, will print it out as orders come in so you don't have to buy a bunch of books at once. Uh, yeah. depends, who, depends who you want to work with. Mm -hmm. And Melvin, if all your all the people you sold your copyrights to are in jail, you could probably put it under a new title and you know yeah, that's oh. that's what John was telling me. I, I actually own the copyrights to the P PDF. I have the file oh. itself. Oh good. And uh, I do have a few paperbacks that I, I bought at a pretty good discount. Uh so I've got a few of those left, but no, I kind of reserve those. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you ever want to publish again, you can come up with a second edition and put it out through uh, Lulu or Kindle or there's a number of them. Yeah, on Amazon. Yeah. And I, so, might look, I, I might look into that because honestly, John, I, I've learned a lot in the 12 years since I right. published and that. There's some you, things that I would alter a bit, but no. not much, pretty much even after all this time. I say about 90, 95% of it is still valid. Yeah. I, I, lo I love that you, you showed the order of a manifestation. You I did know. too. It was perfect as written. You know, yeah. that just really blessed me. And just personally, what I needed to hear was about the faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get, get yeah. There out of, uh, sorry, to get out of Dodge, you know, not know not where you're going, but where you need to know. I have to do that I, next I, week. I, <laughs> I, I'm gonna ramble Literally. here. I'm, I'm gonna ramble here for a minute. Uh, this is in my book, actually. It's uh, not one of the highest points in the book, but to me, it is. It, it's kind of like those uh, manifestations in order, or like a, an algorithm for life. It would go like this: 
make up your mind to do what God says to do. There's wisdom. And God will give you something to do. Word of knowledge. Carry it out. There's faith and believing. You'll get the results. Healing of all kinds. And if you need something special that doesn't follow the natural course, you can get miracles. And you get that down, you can do it over and over and over. Prophecy. You can write your own tomorrow, I guess. And all <laughs> hell can't stop you. There's the stirring of spirits. So that's pretty much the gist of what those mean to me. That's beautiful. Is that smooth or what? That is cool. That is wonderful. <laughs> all right. A, a proverb for living. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm done with that. Thank you all very right, much, Melvin. Everybody. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. I really love the symmetry and the sim symbology also. It's great stuff. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So Thank we're you. going to be going back into Genesis 1 and looking at it from even more perspectives in future sessions. So it'll be worth it to tune in to Tuesday next week. <laughs>